Welcome back, nerds. Fino here with a guide for Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Oh, boy. This guy's a three-star assassin, and I'm not even gonna front. He's probably the single worst servant in Fate Grand Order. But before we go along that dark road, I'd like to thank Chong Mai for picking this as a stream goal. Thanks to you, I've learned far more about the good doctor than any man should. His lore, that is. But we'll get to that in due time. Jekyll is nominally an assassin, but you don't really use him as such. His noble phantasm includes a full heal, so you might be tempted to play for a time as Dr. Jekyll. But the first and most important rule of Henry Jekyll is that you want to spend as little time as Henry Jekyll as possible. Staying in this weak form unnecessarily puts your supports at risk, and trust me when I say this guy 100% needs help to accomplish anything. The only situation where I'd even consider holding my NP is if I draw 0 to 1 of his cards on turn 1. Your transformation turn can be important for your damage, as you'll find out. As an assassin, his skills are also gimped, ranging from a weak 15% attack and crit buff on his first and third skills to an absolutely non-functional stun, 10% base chance to land with a 15% stun chance bonus. He's effectively not a character before turning into Mr. Hyde, and it's the reason that his assassin class is irrelevant. You'll never actually use him as Jekyll, even against Riders. The only time where you actually benefit from his nominal assassin class is during Grailfront events, where he takes a typically low-value assassin slot while keeping any Berserker slots open for more useful picks. Outside of First Assassin, assassins tend to be pretty bad in that mode, so it's a good way of pushing damage while keeping your overall cost low. The real gameplay, however, begins with Jekyll's Noble Phantasm, Dangerous Game. It's an undamaging buster card that turns Jekyll into Hyde, transforming him from an impossibly shit assassin into an impossibly shit berserker. In the process, he gets fully healed and increases both his max health and buster performance indefinitely. You'll see permanent written on wikis, but I say indefinite. And the reason is that these are actual buffs that appear on his bar. And they aren't box buffs, which means they can be purged. I've had this happen to me on quite a few occasions, whether from Ivan's emergency prerogative or that stupid flying snake enemy. By the way, this NP has an upgrade that increases its effect magnitudes, so in the unlikely event that you want to use Jekyll, you should probably take care of that first. That buster buff, though, is tied to his overcharge, and if you can get extra overcharge levels on him, you can reap the benefit of a more potent buster card. Because this effect is indefinite, he can actually justify sacrificing upfront damage to amp his overcharge instead. You could do this with overcharge supports like Kimiko, but I personally prefer a non-overcharge support in the form of Koi and Light. She helps to offset his atrocious star absorption. This stat goes from an Assassin's 99 to a Berserker's 9. So getting stars to stick on him is an absolute nightmare without external help. His alignment also changes to Chaotic Evil, which technically opens up Doman's synergy. Frankly, I think he'd be better off just directly attacking with Doman at that point. But back to the overcharge subject, I prefer using a Craft Essence. Devilish Bodhisattva is your entry-level pick since it grants two stages of overcharge. The drawback is that it has mixed stats, pretty unfortunate considering its other effects become useless after you pop Dangerous Game. Duke of Flame is the next tier up. Its NP damage effect is entirely useless for Hyde, but it does have full attack investment. Your most promising target, though, comes out this summer. It's called Twin Tail, and on top of a full attack investment, it grants Buster and Crit performance. While it got to CE, it does run alongside three of the most powerful servants we'll get this year. So odds are if you want Summer Ibuki, Scotty, or Lady Avalon, you'll end up with a few copies. One of the unflattering things about Jekyll is that he lacks a third Buster card. And it's not like Hyde gets one after transforming, either. So this servant, whose whole gimmick hinges on an indefinite Buster buff, can't Buster Brave Chain. At least not more than once. Because Dangerous Game is treated as a Buster card, you can go NP Buster Buster to get that fabled chain. But oh dear viewer, your misery isn't over yet. In doing this, you'll notice two major problems. The first is that there's zero guarantee you'll ever see both of Jekyll's Buster cards in the same hand. You could be left waiting forever, a problem that only gets worse if you decide to commit Stardom CEs to try to get a strong start. While there are methods of manipulating your drawn cards, they just expose other problems. The Mages Association Mystic Code shows just how fragile Hyde is without the option of hard protection while Bunny Toria just kinda sucks in her own right. Can't bend that on Jekyll. As for problem the second, well, let's take a look at Hyde's skills. One of the perks of being Mr. Hyde is that he gets much better versions of these skills. Monstrous Strength gains an additional 35% attack, Self Modification gets an extra 35% crit damage, and Panicky Voice gains a staggering 135% stun success chance. The idea is that you really want to transform into Hyde before using these skills. Seems simple enough, except wait. This means you aren't getting his Amplified Attack or Crit Buff on the one turn you can bust your Brave Chain. The optimal damage case is straight up impossible for him. In general, I would recommend holding onto Jekyll's skills, especially Panicky Voice since there's no reason to cast it at such a low chance of success. Just save them for your post-transformation turns since there's no guarantee Hyde survives until they come off cooldown. 
You may have noticed that Edward Hyde still has an arts card and he still gains charge. So what exactly does this accomplish? The answer? Absolutely nothing. The interest game shows up on the command card screen, but it doesn't do anything. You can't select it. By extension, this makes his arts card effectively useless. At least before a certain update. One thing you may have noticed missing from Jekyll's kit is star absorption. Remember that Berserkers have extremely low base absorption, which is why Koi and Light is such a good combo with them. You may be tempted to use absorption command codes, but their effect magnitudes are nowhere near the four digits required to make an impactful difference for Berserkers. What I'd recommend instead is crit damage. Heavens and Kurama Child, Mistress of the Heavens, and Blades of Nintendoraku are what I'd personally recommend. And you can save his arts and other quick card for utility effects like debuff cleanses or buff removal codes. This is all in preparation for this coming anniversary, where we get a crucial mechanic exchange. Mighty Chains. After this update, using a quick card at the start of your chain becomes highly effective, since this gives all your cards a flat 20% crit chance on top of what they already have. As someone who can't absorb stars for shit by himself, this is an absolute godsend for Hyde. And this update even makes his arts card useful again. Incorporating all three card types into a single chain creates something called a Mighty Chain, which activates all three starter bonuses, damage, crit chance, and NP gain. If you only use Hyde's cards, this becomes a mighty Brave Chain, and you get a souped-up extra card out of the deal. So by going Quick Arts Buster, you get Hyde's optimal damage combo. I thought about putting Arts first since it doesn't do anything effect-wise, but I recall Arts cards having higher base damage than Quick Cards, so putting it second should give you a bit more punch than the other way around. Another nicety Jekyll gets down the road is an upgrade to self-modification. It's due for this August and adds a battery capping at an impressive 80%. Combined with his Charge of Pen skill, he can immediately NP with any craft essence, which helps to untether him from devilish Bodhisattva. Some miscellaneous fun facts. First of all, this guy is Brynhild's loved one trait, but only as Jekyll, a largely useless interaction. Second and much more interesting is his third of Pen skill. Normally these are relegated to some impractical lore interaction for your average servant, giving them extra damage against a class that you'd never willingly fight with them. And surely enough, Jekyll has anti-saber. No thanks. The fun part is when Jekyll transforms. You might expect this anti-saber pen to turn into a useless crit resistance effect, a pox that afflicts every other berserker. But for Hyde and Hyde alone, it doesn't. Instead, it transforms into an anti-rider pen. As far as I can tell, this makes Edward Hyde the only berserker in the game that gets a functional offensive anti-class pen, one that kind of simulates his would-be assassin function. But even with all these buffs and legs up, Hyde just can't overcome his fundamental flaws. The inability to bust your Brave Chain after transforming, being deathly afraid of having his buffs purged, remember he only gets one shot at Dangerous Game, his Arts card not doing anything besides enabling Mighty Chains, his lack of heart protection, and the fact that he needs constant babysitting, lest he explode into a thousand pieces. On my mistake account, one originally premised on making bad decisions, I thought it'd be funny to Grail Hyde since, you know, he's absolutely atrocious. But around level 92, I realized something. Holy shit, this guy's almost unusably bad. Like, he's not even fun to play with. It's just setting up an impractical team to get him going and watching him crumble at the first signs of resistance. The account where I took Geronimo all the way to 120 couldn't stomach having to carry around Hyde's dead weight. In fact, dealing with Jekyll and Hyde convinced me to switch my focus to grailing more fun servants instead of bottom feeders. This guy is premised on a very cool concept, but the execution leaves him gimped and despite all the band-aid buffs and new buster supports, he's never crossed the threshold from being a dumb meme servant into practical usage. If Dr. Jekyll ever wants to be good, he'll need to brew up some better buffs, or a fundamental rework. As it stands, I think it's pretty appropriate that you get a copy of this guy for finishing the London chapter. He's about as good of a servant as it is a story. Speaking of stories, now for the fun part. The Tale of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. I read the original book while prepping for this video, but I also watched the 1931 movie and I noticed something very strange. They pronounced Jekyll as Jekyll. And then I found out that's how the author wanted it pronounced too. Wild stuff. But there's no way in hell I'm going to call the guy Jekyll. It's like a case of Dr. Giff and Mr. Jiff, if you catch my drift. As for the man himself, Henry Jekyll is a kindly aristocrat living in Victorian London. He's a charitable man beloved around town. But the guy's got an obsession with his own goodness. He knows just as well as any other that he's only human, treading the line between good and evil. While he wasn't so fond of the evil part, the base urges that tempted him towards ignominious deeds and Jekyll found a way to be rid of it. With an esoteric concoction, he could take the evil within him and separate it, give it form, and most importantly, leave only the good behind. And so, with his vast wealth and connections, Dr. Jekyll gathered ingredients in his laboratory and cooked up a bunch of crazy juice. With a swig of this elixir, he does the impossible. He becomes Edward Hyde, the embodiment of all his dark desires. 
and this physically changes him too. In FGO High just looks like a crazed version of Jekyll with messy hair and no glasses, but crazed in the hot Fujoshi approved way. The original Hyde though, not much of a looker. He was hairy and a manlet. Right off the bat Jekyll knew something was off with the guy, but he was also delighted. Surely if this was the distillation of all his darkness, there would only be light remaining. But Jekyll would be sorely disappointed. While Hyde was certainly a sinister little bastard, he himself hadn't become some sort of super Jekyll. No, he was the same. An aging man fearing his own dark impulses. All this experiment had accomplished was giving those impulses a voice and a face. And yet Dr. Jekyll couldn't help but be fascinated with Hyde. When the latter went out to booze and brawl and whore his way through London, Jekyll was aware of it all. In fact, he got a perverse satisfaction from seeing Hyde go out and unleash his it all over the place. He even compares himself to a father at one point, but this is Cope. It's clear Jekyll, denied the shortcut to a singularly righteous life, used Hyde's autonomy as an excuse to indulge his own dark desires without risking a stain upon the good Dr. Jekyll's reputation. Anyone who had the misfortune of meeting Edward Hyde around town would immediately be struck with an intense revulsion even if they can't quite put their finger on why. That's quite alright though, he'd give them a proper reason to hate him in short order. In one incident, he just barrels over some kid on the street, and he only stops when passerby hunt him down and demand restitution. To get out of trouble, he's forced to write a check in Jekyll's name. This convinces him to open a separate account in Hyde's name and sign his checks with his hand angled the wrong way, so it'd be harder for people to connect the dots. The novelty of watching his alter ego start shit around town would quickly fade. One day he wakes up, not as Jekyll, but Hyde. And he realizes this because he sees Hyde's hairy ass hand in the morning. Then he thought back to incidents where the drug didn't work and he had to multiply the dosage. All this combined spooked him. He thought about what he really wanted in life and ultimately chose to live as the old, inoffensive Dr. Jekyll. But maybe he wasn't so resolute in his decision because he kept Hyde's clothes and continued paying for his other hideout, one he only used as Mr. Hyde. By the way, Hyde had been leaving a paper trail that led right back to him. Not only was there the incident with the kid, but Jekyll had to get in and out of his house to transform back and forth. So he told his servants that Hyde was a friend of his and to let him come and go as he pleases. And the whole riding Hyde's checks the wrong way thing didn't fool people for long. So rumors were spreading that Jekyll was being blackmailed or otherwise threatened by the bastard Hyde. An actual friend confronted Jekyll about this. You know what he told them? I will tell you one thing. The moment I choose, I can be rid of Mr. Hyde. I give you my hand upon that. And I thank you again and again, and I will just add one word, Utterson that I'm sure you'll take in good part. This is a private matter, and I beg of you to let it sleep. If Hyde was a drug, Dr. Jekyll could quit anytime he wanted, and for the next two months, he walked the walk. Good old Jekyll doing his doctoring and charity around town, balanced the scales a little for his former misdeeds. Then one day he thought, live a little. But with Edward Hyde, there was no such thing as living just a little. You know what a sleep dead is? You stay up till 5 a.m. playing video games and deal with the rest of the day on two hours sleep, you might feel like shit even a day later, and that's because you still owe those four hours you missed. Mr. Hyde didn't have sleep debt. He had a vice debt, and two months of evil came out with a glopping noise. He goes and murders some guy on the street, completely unprovoked. Except it wasn't just some random guy. It was a member of parliament, and he committed this murder with Jekyll's cane and left a chunk of it there at the scene of the crime. Suffice to say Hyde couldn't show his face in public ever again. He now had no choice but to hide within Jekyll, lest he be discovered and strung up. And Jekyll for his part went into overdrive with his philanthropy to balance the scales. Then he let his guard down. For a moment, he looked upon his work with satisfaction, internally gloating about how awesome and kind Henry Jekyll is. Way better than those other lazy bums he called neighbors. And that was all it took. He turned into Hyde. But this wasn't in the comfort of his own home. No, he was in the park when this happened. He was panicking and had no way of sneaking back into his own home where his ingredients were. His servants would see Hyde and rat him out. But then he had an idea. As Hyde, his default handwriting was still his own, so he wrote a letter posing as Jekyll and sent it off to a friend. As it turns out, Hyde had some capacity for self-preservation, and he could not only restrain his own brutality, but also pretend to be another if it aided his immediate goals. The letter, written to one Dr. Lanyon, asked him to go and work with a locksmith to extract the contents of a specific drawer in his lab, and then passed this along to a visitor that will come to his house at midnight. And while this all seems impossibly suspicious, it's a matter of life and death for Jekyll, so it's better that he doesn't ask too many questions. Well, Lanyon wasn't buying it, so when it came time to pass the chemicals along, he kept a revolver handy just in case. Surely enough, the man at his doorstep, wearing clothes that are way too big for him and constantly glancing over his shoulder, is Edward Hyde. 
Once inside, Hyde throws together a batch of his potion and asks to leave, but Langan insists on knowing the truth. So he takes it, right in front of him. The sight of Hyde turning into Jekyll and the latter's explanation leave Lanyon so shaken and disturbed that he falls deeply ill and dies not too long after this encounter. After this point, the involuntary transformations started happening more and more frequently. He'd be lucky to go six hours without trouble, and if he slept for even a moment, he'd wake up his hide. So he did all he could to stay awake, which did terrible things to his health. Unable to leave the house and resenting Jekyll's hatred of him, Hyde in turn would pass the time by fucking with him destroying his mementos and defacing his books with dreadful annotations. In the end, even this mutual purgatory would come to an end. Jekyll had to constantly dose himself to keep from transforming, and this is where the train went completely off the rails. One of the ingredients Jekyll needed for his elixir was a certain salt, and he was running low. No worries, he had plenty of suppliers. Except wait. This patch isn't doing the trick. Return it. This one isn't either. Must be impure, send it back. And then he just kept going on and on in search of pure salt, but then he realized something. The salt that doesn't do anything? That's the pure stuff. The original batch he ordered? That was contaminated, and whatever the mystery ingredient, it was the key to his transformation. He had no idea what it is, and therefore no way of getting any more. The second his old reserves were depleted, that was it. Henry Jekyll would be gone forever. He writes one final confession while Hyde slumbers. In the meantime, Jekyll's friends and servants had become mighty disturbed by Jekyll's erratic behavior and extreme isolation. They thought something terrible had happened to him and came up the stairs. They demanded to speak with him and if he didn't reply, they'd break down his door. When instead the voice of Hyde begged them to stop, they really started going to town. Once it finally broke, they found Hyde dead on the ground. Apparently, he'd fatally dosed himself with one of the chemicals to avoid capture. While looking around, they then found Jekyll's last letter. And who better to put this story to bed than the late doctor? On Hyde he muses, Had it not been for his fear of death, he would long ago have ruined himself in order to involve me in the ruin. But his love of life is wonderful. I go further. I, who sicken and freeze at the mere thought of him, when I recall the objection and passion of this attachment, and when I know how he fears my power to cut him off by suicide, I find it in my heart to pity him. Will Hyde die upon the scaffold, or will he find courage to release himself at the last moment? God knows I'm careless. This is my true hour of death, and what is to follow concerns another than myself. Here then, as I lay down the pen and proceed to seal up my confession, I bring the life of that unhappy Henry Jekyll to an end. Thanks for watching. Once again, I'd like to thank Trung Mai for picking this as a stream goal. For anyone that got this far, let me know if you enjoyed this video, subscribe for more, and come on to my twitch.tv slash Tyson, where I stream every weekend, 3 p.m. Pacific time, Friday through Sunday. I'll be rolling for a fest gun when the case file rerun likely comes out, so stop on by to catch that live. See you there.